how is climate change affecting the incidence of diseases transmitted by animals and insects? So I understand climate change to mean changing weather patterns in certain areas. So for example, certain countries may be experiencing warmer climates that were previously um, colder countries, or if for example humidity, there might be countries which were previously more humid um, that become less humid, or countries that were less humid that become more humid. So it's all about these changing weather patterns. And this to start with impacts um, the migration of animals that may be vectors for certain diseases. So for example, vector for malaria is, is mosquitoes, and they may be moving from areas that were more humid, with large bodies of water uh, in areas that were hotter to areas that are becoming hotter and becoming more humid with climate change. Another example of a mosquito uh, carry disease is dengue fever. So these are two examples of um, conditions which we may see a changing incidence with climate change. Another factor to consider is globalisation and increased air travel. So we may be seeing people travelling more post-Covid and these animals with carrying certain diseases may be on these um, ships or planes and they then may be moving to areas which didn't have high incidence of these diseases before. These are certain factors we think about. We can also think about potentially mutations with these, uh, these viruses that are carried by these animals. If these animals are moving more into potentially larger populations where they weren't present before, we may be seeing higher rates of mutation within the viruses and that's obviously a larger problem going beyond climate change and into how we can um, potentially tackle that. What does the concept of preventable deaths mean to you? So when we think about preventable deaths, we want to think about deaths that can be averted by some means. So we can start by thinking of preventable deaths in terms of deaths caused by misdiagnosis within by a healthcare professional or just within healthcare in general. So this could be due to um, an abnormality on a scan that's not been picked up or maybe just due to a slow diagnosis that's led to a condition progressing beyond the point of being able to be treated or at least treated effectively. And so we might be thinking about certain cancers where we've missed marks on scans and preventable deaths in this case are a real chance for reflection within the healthcare profession. And we can reflect as a group actually and within a team of healthcare professionals, not just doctors, but within nurses and healthcare assistants as well about um, what this misdiagnosis could mean and how we can all learn from this going forward so we can learn to spot the signs so this sort of situation doesn't happen again. But we can also think about preventable deaths in terms of deaths caused by certain lifestyle factors. So for example, diseases caused by poor diet or malnutrition, or diseases caused by lack of exercise, which then leads to obesity. There are many obesity related conditions, for example, type two diabetes. So these are conditions obviously that if we were to potentially increase awareness about um, these lifestyle factors which we could prevent or at least slow the progress of. But we can also think about lifestyle factors in terms of um, mental health related conditions, for example alcoholism may lead to extreme depression or anxiety and, and if we can tackle alcoholism then we could potentially prevent deaths caused by um, certain mental health conditions and diseases. Uh, but we can also think about, in the same vein, drugs and smoking. These can lead to conditions such as lung cancer, if we're talking about smoking, or drugs could lead to, again, certain mental health conditions, which then may result in a fatality. So overall, we can think about preventable deaths in terms of these two factors. Preventable deaths caused by a misdiagnosis and preventable deaths caused by certain lifestyle factors, which then lead to a disease that ultimately results in a death. Should TikTok be banned from providing mental health information? So I understand TikTok to be a social media platform that's a video sharing platform where anybody is able to post videos um, on it. On the one hand, we can we could argue that TikTok should be banned from allowing mental health information to be posted because we can't regulate who posts on it. We can't ensure that the people posting this information or this advice are professionals and therefore anyone's able to access this advice and it may ultimately result in worse outcomes for these people if the, the advice they're, being, they're receiving is not obviously optimal and it's not the right sort of advice they should be getting. But on the other hand, we could argue that TikTok should be a platform where mental health information can be posted. There are certain schemes, for example, on platforms like YouTube, where mental health professionals can now become verified on the platform. And that could allow um, trained individuals to provide advice quickly and easily that's accessible to all on a platform such as TikTok. And then that can lead to earlier diagnosis of certain mental health conditions, which can ultimately lead to better outcomes for patients. 
So I would argue in conclusion that it depends on how TikTok's being regulated. If TikTok could put in such a scheme like YouTube has done, potentially we could see it being a useful platform for mental health information, but it has to be under regulated use. Um, and obviously we want to ensure people are getting accurate, correct information that could lead to the correct diagnosis and the correct treatment. Why do you think people stopped with public health guidance during the COVID-19 pandemic? So I think to start with here, there was an issue with the actual messaging around the guidance. There was a lot of mixed messaging and unclear messages coming from the government about, for example, with masks, when um, and where and for how long people should wear masks, in what situations. There was also these restrictions in certain areas. So the tiered system was put into place and there were certain limits on social interactions and people were quite unclear about which tier they were in um, and what rules were in place in their area. And I think going on from this, in the mixed messaging, there was obviously um, certain breaches of COVID restrictions from certain government officials, which led to some people having mistrust in um, whether these restrictions were really necessary and obviously then struggling with adhering to them themselves. I think we can also then move on to thinking about vaccines. We had quite a successful vaccine rollout, very quick vaccine rollout within the UK, and there was quite a lot of confidence about the protection these vaccines would give a high proportion of the population. And this could have potentially led to people feeling they were no longer vulnerable to the COVID virus. And I think Leading on from that though, we can also think about vaccine hesitancy. And so whether right or wrong, some people obviously are a bit uh, skeptical and unsure about taking um, the COVID vaccine. And so they struggled when there were certain restrictions in place, for example, that were limited by whether you'd been vaccinated or not. Um, they were unsure about getting vaccinated themselves and weren't getting clear advice from certain um, areas of the government and health professionals about going forward in the process like what could happen for them if they weren't sure about the, the vaccine. So yeah, to conclude, I think we can think about that in terms of mixed messaging, leading to people struggling with restrictions, being unsure about what restrictions were in place, and also about vaccines, so the success of the vaccine program, but on the other hand also vaccine um, hesitancy and people being unsure about taking the COVID vaccine. Discuss the pros and cons of using AI in surgical specialties. So when I think about what AI means to start with, I would think about AI to be the use of specialised computers or computer systems to process large amounts of data to recognise trends or patterns. And I think we can look at the use of AI in terms of the prevention, diagnosis and treatment of certain conditions in patients. So if we start with prevention, we can use AI to sort patients into groups and recognise who's at higher risk and who's at lower risk and then for those higher risk patients, we can rec like recommend strategies or changes to their lifestyle which they can put in place, which can then help them to prevent a condition from developing or from progressing. Then in terms of diagnosis, we can think about using AI to actually analyze test results. So for example, blood test results, detecting abnormalities in blood tests that potentially wouldn't be picked up by healthcare professionals, or looking at scans and detecting small changes, which again are hard to detect with the human eye, because AI can ultimately go through large quantities of previous patient scans, and it can recognize these smaller changes um, over time, and it's more likely to pick up on smaller changes that have led to a patient than have being diagnosed with a condition. Then in terms of treatment, we can use AI to look at what the best treatment options are for patients. So again, going back to this idea of sorting through large groups of data and looking at what treatment plan place for previous patients can be really helpful in terms of us picking an optimum treatment plan for our current patients. Um, and AI can assist doctors in doing that. But overall, we have to also think about AI's cons um, data privacy is a massive problem with AI. We have to load all this patient data into a computer system so that it can be processed. And obviously we need trained professionals to be able to use an AI to the best of its ability so we can get the benefits of it. And that can be quite an expensive process to train up these people. So it's got pros and cons in terms of benefiting accuracy diagnosis of patients, but also we have to think about data privacy and have to have regulations in place um, to prevent that going out of control. How can medical professionals help ensure the safety and emotional well-being of hospital patients? 
So if we start by thinking about the safety of hospital patients, we want to be regularly communicating with patients to find out about their physical needs and the MDT is a great tool to be able to do this because they have such a wide range of skills and abilities, they really have a good 360 view of a patient, for example speech and language therapists, um, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, they're all regularly interacting with the patient and can tell us a lot about the physical state of the patient which can then be fed back to doctors and other healthcare professionals so that we can all work together to ensure the safety of the patient. And this regular monitoring could involve blood tests or checking on medication just to make sure that physically the patient's needs are being met. If we move on to then emotional well-being, the MDT is a great tool again. They've got, they're regularly interacting with the patient, they've got um, great abilities to find out about the patient concerns or the patient's needs. And we can use a framework which I've heard of called ICE, Ideas, Concerns, Expectations, to address these needs. And the MDT can really apply this when speaking to patients regularly and communicating with them. So to conclude, if we're thinking about the safety and emotional well-being of patients, we want to use the ICE framework to try and meet these needs. And we want to make use of the MDT, so including speech and language therapists, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, healthcare assistants and nurses and doctors as well, working all together to be able to meet these different needs and assess the emotional and well-being and the safety of patients whilst they're in hospital so that we get the best outcome for them when they end up leaving hospital. The NHS confronts a shortage of radiologists. How can AI technologies enhance diagnostic accuracy and support overburdened radiology services? So thinking about AI in the context of radiology, AI talks about or thinks about neural networks and how they can process and look at large quantities of data to find trends and patterns. And that's particularly important in uh, diagnostic scans, such as CT scans, PET scans and ultrasounds. AI can be used to detect gross abnormalities with all of these types of scans and then these scans can be further reviewed by a radiologist who can detect smaller changes and smaller details which should perhaps be missed by the AI network. And this is really important because it increases the efficiency of the service of using diagnostic scans to diagnose certain diseases and that can then reduce the burden and the workload on radiologists themselves leading to a better work-life balance and ultimately creating more capacity in the NHS which is particularly important when we are currently experiencing strain capacity in the NHS at the moment. AI is also really important in terms of diagnostic scans in improving the sensitivity and specificity of the scans themselves. So we can potentially increase in terms of diagnosis if we're using AI because AI can process other scans that have been done in the past and large numbers of scans to look at changes and then use that to detect changes on our current scan we're looking at to essentially see if there's a change that's not been picked up by a radiologist or vice versa. If the scan, if the AI doesn't pick up a change, then the radiologist can review the scan further. So there needs to be an interaction between the radiologist and the AI to be able to make best use of this. And overall, but AI does have benefits in terms of diagnostic scans, but we'd want to trial this in a clinical context to be able to fully confirm whether it was a more efficient way to look at these diagnostic scans and to diagnose patients in radiology. What are the implications of fewer home visits being conducted by doctors post-Covid? So I think first we want to think about which patients are accessing these home visits and this tends to be vulnerable groups or elderly people who if they aren't able to receive a home visit might not be able to access a doctor or a healthcare professional via technology or a computer-based consultation either because they might not be experienced with this technology or comfortable in using it. So ultimately, if these home visits aren't available to them, this might lead to preventing or stopping a diagnosis from being made or preventing treatment from being put in place, which could lead to ultimately worse outcomes for these patients in terms of their actual health. But we can also think of home visits in terms of their importance for the connection between a doctor and a patient. It's really important that doctors and patients are able to have this personal interaction because it really builds trust between the two of them, which is so important, not only in terms of that actual connection and that bond that they can form, but also in terms of actually diagnosing or treating a condition. Often patients will be more likely to open up to a doctor and tell them about their symptoms if they trust them. And if they have the full scope of information available to them, then they're better able to treat a patient and ultimately lead to a better outcome for the patient themselves. So overall, fewer home visits could be really detrimental to these vulnerable groups and elderly people. 
who can't otherwise access healthcare by different means and it could be really damaging for the trust between the doctor and the patient and the relationship that they're able to form. More and more young people are developing cancer in the modern world. Consider the reasons for and against this statement. So I think the first thing to break down is the fact that this may not necessarily be true as we've got greater diagnostic abilities um, in the modern world. So we're able, there's greater numbers of screening programmes, we're able to screen for a lot more cancers and so we're able to diagnose not only a larger range of cancers but we're able to more quickly and efficiently diagnose cancer in younger people. And this is partially a result of these screening programs have been put in place in the UK but also it's a result of young people having greater access to information about the symptoms of certain cancers which is then resulting to ultimately more diagnoses being made um, and that may be having an impact on the rate seeming to go up the true number might have always been the same stage but we're now being able to detect these cancers more, more readily um, but then we can also think about potential factors that could be leading to higher cancer rates among younger people. So for example, certain environmental conditions like air pollution or microplastics, certain lifestyle factors such as ultra-processed foods, um, sedentary lifestyles. And I think these are obviously all factors that can lead to certain things like obesity and also certain other maybe malnourishment that can then result in people developing certain cancers. But I think we need to go back to the point that obviously it's very difficult to control these factors when we're looking, when we're doing studies on younger people, when we're looking at cancer in younger people, because these factors change in people's lives all of the time. So really, although we can see a correlation here, it doesn't necessarily mean these factors are causing and increasing cancer rates. And, and so we need to do further studies where we can control certain factors potentially to be able to confirm whether these rates really are increasing among younger people or whether it's simply increased um, ability to diagnose cancers among younger people that's causing this. What are the positive and negative effects of Google on patient healthcare and wellbeing? So to start with, to think about the positive aspects, obviously Google provides an easily and free accessible resource um, for people to find healthcare information online. And there is a large proportion of information that is accurate information. For example, the NHS website is often being boosted on when you search up certain symptoms or certain conditions, which is really helping for patients to receive accurate um, and reliable information and be referred to the right course of treatment on from that, so whether that's seeing their GP or potentially even when to call 111 um, or when to call 999 if that's necessary. But then if you look at it on the other hand, there's obviously many sites which provide unregulated, inaccurate information to people when they search up certain symptoms and conditions, which can lead them to making assumptions about what disease or condition they may have, which can then result in these patients referring themselves on for example, to places like A&E. So if we take A&E, if we had people coming in with coughs and colds, this would obviously lead to the NHS becoming very overwhelmed and prevent us seeing patients who really need to be seen urgently. So that's obviously a problem we want to prevent and we want regulations in place to prevent those websites from um, providing information to patients who may be vulnerable to seeing it and then making assumptions and taking the wrong action. So overall, although Google can have positive effects, there are many verified websites where people can get accurate, free information. We want to make sure that, that those websites which are not verified and unregulated are in the minority and are not encouraged for people to refer to when they've got a condition or a symptom of a disease. If you enjoyed this interview, be sure to check out our online interview course.